and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Please allow me to introduce Dean Schweitzer, a professor in radiology and the leader of our medical school at Wayne State University. Good day, Dean Schweitzer. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Ruba. And this is a very important constituency for Southeast Michigan and for the School of Medicine. Thank you. Um, so today's session will discuss the impact of COVID pandemic on medical school admission and education. Dean Schweitzer, you were appointed to your position around the beginning of the pandemic. What was it like to take over in a challenging time of a great uncertainty? I would say there's three aspects of that. One is the challenge of modifying the medical school curriculum because of the pandemic. Two is to try and understand what opportunities might be created by the pandemic because I do believe clouds have silver linings to some degree. And I think there were teaching advantages that were created from the pandemic. But three is the intangible loss of self and loss of location. Um, I started coming back to the office a few weeks ago, but it's hard to start a new position and not physically be in a new position. And that intangible, I think, um, was the hardest and is the hardest thing uh, to adapt to. Um, school started today for, for most students in uh, Southeast Michigan. And the loss of the social aspect of education, the interpersonal, the um, development of non-academic skills, I think was the greatest loss. And I have concerns how much of that um, can be made up. Now, it's less so for medical students, but they still, I think, or I fear, have this loss of connection to their co-students, to their professors. Um, that's the intangible that keeps me up at night. I hear you. So my second question to you, um, what was the impact of the pandemic on the medical school admissions process? Yeah, I, I would say there were three, there's always three, <laughs> there were three. Um, the number of applications went up. I, I think society realized um, the importance of healthcare. And so it brought the consciousness to students who may have been on the fence about applying to a healing profession. The second thing it did, I think, is resorted individuals' priorities about what, what's important in life and what's not. Uh, I once had a resident who was a, a financier in Wall Street and made a lot of money as a financier in Wall Street. But he woke up one day saying, is this what I want my epitaph, epitaph to be, that I um, facilitated this deal or I did this IPO? And he decided to go back to college and eventually go to medical school and became a radiology uh, resident. So I think not only did people understand or students understand the importance of the healing professions, but it internally deprioritized or reprioritized um, what their values were. And the third thing is with virtual interviews, uh, it levels the playing field to some degree because the costs of traveling to schools and doing interviews um, is lessened to, to a marked degree. And it evens out that playing field to disadvantaged students, which is extremely important. But at the same time, the connectivity is harder to have in a remote interview. Um, certain people can be really good in the remote interview and it may um, over advantage them. And you may not, you know, if someone is shy or quiet, 
um, it may disadvantage them. Uh, so there are pluses, there are minuses. The minuses, I think, mostly outweigh the pluses, but there are some pluses. I hear you, yeah. Uh, well, we have a big question about the interview. I'm coming to that later. But um, the other questions about the pandemic and uh, if it affected the number of um, and the number and and you answered me kind, but how about the diversity of the applicants uh, to Wayne State? Was it also affected? Well, diversity is very important to a school like Wayne State. I often say um, most medical schools have one mission, which is to train really good doctors. And Wayne State has two missions, to train really good doctors, but to be a nidus for societal change. And Wayne State has always been that. We've always been representative of the community for which we, we exist. So um, the diversity part of this is very important. Now, there are so many complex things that go into an equation. So we have the most diverse class we've had um, probably in 30 years. Um, but we made a lot of phone calls to students. And most importantly, I think pipeline programs. Because the barrier to attending medical school is happens long before the application process. Uh, we have um, a chair of pediatrics, Dr. Herman Gray. Um, who and is an amazing chair of pediatrics, is an amazing person, and um, such an amazing person that he previously ran Children's Hospital. He told me a story um, that resonates with me every day. Uh, he was pre-med, um, and in his first year of college, he got a so-so grade on a test. And a professor said to him, Herman, maybe you should rethink applying to medical school. Maybe you should have a different career choice. And he goes home to his mother and explains that anecdote to his mother. And his mother says to him, don't you believe them? Um, you are a smart kid, you can do whatever you want. And the rest is history. But imagine if Dr. Gray didn't have a mother to say that to him. Or imagine if he didn't even bring that up and just got discouraged. So the barrier to medical school for many disadvantaged occurs before the applications process. So we put a lot of effort into pipeline programs like the post back program and the med direct program among many others because our diversity wasn't affected just by the pandemic. We have long ongoing programs and interventions to facilitate being representative of the community for which we're living. And I believe strongly the school should be representative of the community for which we're living. That's great. So um, thank you. The other question has, again, going back to the interview, I get these questions a lot. And it's really concerning um, the students, their parents, and it has probably three, three parts, going back to three. It's so, always great. So it, it's the interviews are a very important part of the medical school um, admission process, as you know. So with the last year being largely online, how do you think virtual interviews have impacted the interview experience? And you mentioned it, Itach, you brushed on yeah. it. And what, and do you have any feedback for the applicants yeah. And the last part of it, do you anticipate interviews continuing to be virtual? Yeah, I'll answer the third part first. So according to the AAMC, um, um, interviews should continue to be virtual, um, both for medical school as well as for residencies. To the point even that if a student is a one of your medical students, you still have to do a virtual interview to make sure, as we stated earlier, the playing field is even. Now, there are different skills that are needed for a virtual interview. Um, how you set up your lighting, um, the distance that you are away from the screen. I don't think I did a good job today. 
Oh, I, I, I make sure I close my bathroom before <laughs> behind me. <laughs> make sure you do that. But one of the big things is to have one third of your torso visible because more of the communication is the body language of your torso than it actually is the body language of the face. And the mistake I think many students and many professionals make in interviews, Zoom interviews, is they concentrate more on the face than on the torso and on the hands. Um, this point is about how you should dress, which is differently than an in-person interview. Um, for both men and women, a brighter tie or brighter scarf is um, better on um, video than it would be in person. But the, the intangible part of that to get to your first question is really the important thing. Um, to do your best to create a connection with the person who's interviewing you, um, to listen to what they say, to pause before you answer, to look in their eyes, look at the camera so that you have this connection. When I first started lecturing, um, one of my mentors used to say that introduce yourself and say a few sentences before you dim the lights. And then you dim the lights and then you give your lecture. Because if you don't do that, you're a disembodied voice and there's no connection to your audience. So I think that rule applies to these video interviews as well. You don't wanna be a disembodied voice. You wanna be an individual. You wanna have that connection. And then the last interview pointer I would give to potential applicants and students is to research the school, to know something about each school that you apply to, strengths and weaknesses, so that the person who's interviewing you knows that this interview means something to you, means something enough that you research this. Um, I was interviewing a potential chair for OBGYN last Thursday or Friday. And uh, this person had listened to my town halls that are available online and was taking phrases from those town halls and reading them back to me. Now I'm an experienced interviewer and I was able to see through that, but it was a very effective technique that they used to show that they were interested enough to spend time researching. And as an applicant, you should know what's different about Wayne State, what's different about Michigan State, what's different about Oakland, that you had researched this and this school is important to you and elucidate that during the interview. And my last interview suggestion is always have a question and try and make those questions different than the questions that are available on the web. Um, everyone interviewing you has heard the standard 20 questions a hundred times. And um, it's very um, energy draining to hear it the hundred and first time. So try and have a specific question about that school that's different than you would learn online. That's, thank you for the tips. I would use that also. <laughs> I wish I had more tips when I was interviewing. I interviewed very poorly when I applied for medical school. You know, before going to the next questions, um, something came to my mind since we're talking about the interviews. And I'm thinking about going back and before reaching the interview. And I know that Wayne State um, look at the applicant holistically. Yeah. And I get these questions a lot. So what do you mean exactly? And um, is it the grade doesn't matter anymore than if you look holistically? Or is it the MCAT? Or is it the combination? Can you just shed some light over this? Yeah, that's a good question. Because I got this this morning, actually, before yeah. some people know that I'm you know, talking to you. And like, please, can you shed some light on this? That's an excellent question. Um, holistically means you try and look at the applicant in their entirety as an individual. 
Um, and I'll give you one example that I find um, discouraging but enlightening in terms of your question. That um, the common application asks what your parents do for a living and their um, uh, level of education, which is a question that just makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Um, why does it matter if your parents run a gas station or your parents are college professors? And the argument that the AAMC gives, the Association of Medical Schools, is that they want to see how far you've gone. So if your parents are prison guards and you're applying for an MD PhD program, you've gone a long way. And I still have difficulty with that question, but that question does encapsulate the concept of holistic evaluations. So no one is ever going to say that grades are unimportant. No one is ever going to say that MCATs are unimportant. But at Wayne and at multiple other schools, the whole of the individual is important. Um, would they fit in here? Um, is Wayne a space holder for them because it's the best school they got into? Or do they really have a desire to learn and be educated in this environment, which is a very different environment than most medical schools? Um, are they the type of person who went to a very small college? And how would they deal with having a medical school that has more than 300 kids in a class? So holistic doesn't mean that grades are unimportant, but it does mean, is this kid likely to be successful in this environment and to be an important contributor to society for the long run? And can Wayne as a school of medicine facilitate their development into that individual? Thank you. I mean, the audience here, most of them physicians, and believe me, 99% of their kids are going to medical school. So this question, like, what's your parents doing? Is it working against them? For us, it doesn't. Um, but I, if I was making up that application, I wouldn't have that question. Um, I, I, I think that we're all creatures of bias. And however well-meaning that question might be, it's open and rife with creating bias in the reader. And um, I don't like it. Uh, I am an editor of a journal uh, in my spare time. And I reviewed papers for many, many years. And radiology papers are always double-blinded where uh, the person reviewing doesn't know who the authors were. But as an editor, you get to see who the authors are. And it makes me feel dirty. It makes me feel like I'm seeing something I shouldn't be seeing. And I try like the Dickens to not look who the authors are because it can't help but bias you. And I think looking at what your parents do can't help but bias you. You know, if you came from a lower socioeconomic background, if the parents are successful, you might have a chip on your shoulder and that biases you. If you're from a high socioeconomic background and the parents are working class people, that also might create a bias. So I agree, it's, um, there's a potential for bias there. We do our best to minimize that risk, but it is there. Thank you, thanks for your feedback. Um, I'm moving to a kind of different question. So um, the COVID, pandemic has definitely placed some strains um, on the economy and financial aspects nationwide. How has this affected financial aid and scholarships directed toward medical students' education? Uh, we've worked very hard and successfully to keep financial aid and scholarships actually higher than they were before. Um, because as a dean, I've allocated pretty much every donation to financial aid um, rather than building a 70 MRI or a new building or, or what have you. Um, the pandemic has caused um, stress in the medical school budget overall, but that has to do with operations rather than financial aid. Um, Wayne State is a bargain. Uh, it's the cheapest medical school in Michigan. And unless you live in Texas, one of the cheapest in the country. Thank you. Um, going also back to the pandemic, 
Um, thank you, though. Uh, what are some efficient changes and strategies that our School of Medicine has created and would like to keep as we hopefully um, reach the end of the pandemic or in a different stage uh, of the pandemic? So Wayne was a somewhat Zoom-oriented medical school before the pandemic. Sure. Before the pandemic. Um, where for the large lecture hall groups, um, the students didn't attend in person or very few did. So triaging to pandemic-based education wasn't a huge change. The other advantage Wayne has and had is that we're a roll up your sleeves, get things done medical school. Always have been, and as long as I'm around, always will be. And hence, um, the hospitals wanted our students there because they rolled their sleeves and they helped. Now, what will continue after the pandemic? I, I think education is going to be different. I think um, there will be more Zoom classes, more Teams classes, what have you. But medicine, um, the physical aspects of medicine can't be taught remotely. You have to look at a patient. You have to understand how hospitals work. You have to learn the interpersonal skills to motivate those around you. And, and those are crucial aspects um, for the physician going forward. So I used to work in Canada and they have this thing called can meds in Canada which are all the aspects of a physician that don't have to do with the science of medicine. And I always keep those in the back of my mind because it's hard not to teach students the science of medicine. Almost all medical schools do a, a pretty good job about that. But these other skills, these health advocacy skills, these communication skills um, are very, very important. Um, I used to live in Long Island and my family doctor would never renew a prescription without saying it. He would give me 90 days and I'd have to go into his office. Uh, and my wife would say, you know, he wants to get his copay, he wants to get the billing, but that wasn't the reason. The reason was he wanted to see me each time. Did I gain weight? Did I lose weight? Um, did I look robust? Did I look stressed? And those to him were important parts of our patient physician interaction. And, and that can only be done in person. Now, certain parts of medical care um, actually are more successful done remotely. And, and psychiatry is one of them. Because if you're in a room with an individual and talking about a difficult circumstance and a student is nearby, um, the student can't help but um, impede some of that openness of communication. But if the student is just looking at their own Zoom meeting and they're muted, um, we found that the students learn better in that environment. So 90%, I think, need to be done in person. Um, but 10%, I think, and I do think it will fundamentally and permanently change uh, some part of not just medical education, but all education. Be curious what happens in the next three years. Actually, um, the second question is kind of like related. It's from the medical students. It's about the clinical rotations. You know, it's kind of in the education aspect. And um, so many things changed. Some were suspended. Others were suboptimized. Yeah. And things keep changing. Um, so how, um, how did you deal with this? And uh, what's the plan going forward? Uh, what do you think regarding the medical students' clinical rotations? Would, would it be suspended, some of it? How are you yeah. dealing with this? So the initial response to the pandemic was panic. <laughs> Everyone panicked. Um, I was speaking to someone earlier today, and schools just started for elementary school students in, in Michigan today. And they said to me, the only difference between now and a year ago is that there's a more infectious variant around, yet the kids are going back to school. And I think it's because we panicked a little bit beforehand. And we panicked because we had no data. We had no 
we weren't able to make analytic decisions. We made um, decisions based upon suboptimal information and information that was suboptimal we didn't realize was suboptimal. So several of our clinical partners limited the amount of medical students they had and what rotations they had, um, but that was pretty short-lived. So I don't think that's gonna happen again. And again, Wayne State students are known to help out to be important parts of the team. Um, being a student at Wayne State is not a spectator sport, it's a participant sport. So I don't think here, and I think in most schools, it's not likely to have a permanent effect, um, irregardless of, of what happens with the waxing and waning of the pandemic. Well, and you know that we have now a different stage with the Delta variant and everybody's so scared. So I have two, two questions. Third boosters, are we giving it number one? We don't have it yet as a physicians. How about the students? Everybody's scared. So where do you think we're going? Yeah, so we'll get the third booster, um, whether it's six or eight months after your initial vaccine. Um, they'll be start being distributed um, around the third week of September. Um, my concern is twofold. Um, the percentage of the population that's unvaccinated, um, which is not high in Michigan, but high in many states, leading to the development of um, uh, new variants that have the possibility of A, being more infectious like the Delta is, B, being more lethal in some ways like the Delta is at least more debilitating, and, and thirdly, potentially resistant to the vaccine. And, and that, that's the nightmare scenario. But my greater concern is animal hosts. And um, all the medical student, medical school deans meet about once every two weeks. Um, and we have a, an evening meeting of presentations. And this was about six months ago. And we had presentations about rats being animal hosts for COVID. And my concern is that they're going to develop mutations in animals and it's gonna become this vicious circle where animals get mutations and then the mutations spread to humans. And then we have the next COVID and however depressing that is. So I'm very concerned about the low penetrance of vaccination, but I'm even more concerned about animal host and mutations that occur in animal host. I know it's very depressing. I was reading this article over the weekend that said 60% of deer in Michigan had antibodies to COVID. Uh, yeah, I don't want to hear that, but I hear you. Yeah, it's yes. depressing. Well, let, let, let's go back to the student. Let's go back to the pre-med. Um, <laughs> last couple of questions. Um, I know my son is interested in gap year and I keep resisting. I like to hear one more time about gap year. Is it a must? Would it strengthen the application? Um, or it depends? The answer is it depends. Um, if we go back to the holistic evaluation of the student, um, I, I was interviewing, um, so I went to a six year med program and I graduated medical school at age 23. And at that point, most radiology residencies required an internship and there were about a dozen that did not. And I only wanted to attend one that didn't, however bad a residency it was, I was fixated on this. And I went to interview in Kentucky for one of the residencies that didn't require an internship. And the guy spent the entire interview reaming me that I was too young to skip an internship that I needed this year of maturing. And at the end of the interview, and I'll do my bad Southern accent um, imitation, he goes, well, son, you got to understand that a 23-year-old from New York City is a lot different than a 23-year-old from Lexington, Kentucky. And that, to me, encapsulates the holistic approach to applicants and the gap year. Um, certain people need it to buff their CV, to buff their credentials, and I understand that. Certain people need it because they're not sure and they need an experience to help them make sure. Certain people need it as a maturing process because of wherever they went to college, whatever their family life was, they, they need a little bit of independence. 
But certain people are the 22 year old from New York City who grows up really fast and, and maybe doesn't need that maturing process. So it's holistic and it's based upon the individual. You know, Wayne historically has always taken older students than most medical schools. And it's something I'm proud of because I think we, we, play, a, we play a role in that. Um, it's part of our role in society, but um, it's not right for everyone. And those who it's right for should do it. And those who it's not right for shouldn't do it. I, I wish we can keep you more and I have way more questions. And I know we have another event um, next month together. So, uh, but with the, with the time permit, I don't think I, I can uh, ask any questions, but uh, would you like um, to share any final thoughts or comments with us? Uh, I, and thank you, Ruba. They were excellent questions and to all those who submitted the questions. Um, I believe a school should be representative, as said this before, of the society that it's in. And I also said before, I'm an editor of a medical journal. And when I became editor, I wanted to make sure that the leadership of the editors, the editorial leadership was representative of the society. So when I first came, they were all men, all MDs, all from North America. And after several years, they're half women, half MDs and half PhDs, and 60% outside of the US. Because any institution to serve its um, audience best needs to be representative of that audience. So this group is an important part of our constituency. African-Americans are an important part of our constituency. Um, Native Americans, it's interesting, this coming class that started in July has 3% Native Americans, which is the percentage of Native Americans in Michigan. So I think we do a good job, we could do better, but I think we do a pretty good job of being representative of the community for which we live in. And this constituency is an important part of that community. And these conversations are an important part of addressing those stakeholders who have a, a valid and important um, interest and um, interactions with the medical school. And I thank you for the, for the interest and we appreciate the applicants and I wish everyone the best of luck. Thank you so much. On behalf of NAMA, NAMA's leader and the uh, conference committee, we truly thank you so much. Okay, thank you for your time. Enjoy San Diego.